It's Juneteenth, Freedom Day, Jubilee Day. Many black Americans have been celebrating this day since the late 1800s, but it only came into focus for most other Americans after the protests for racial justice, after police killed George Floyd in 2020, and Juneteenth became a national holiday just two years ago. So we're still learning how to celebrate it. What Juneteenth means and a dive into black history in the Adirondacks on today's Story of the Day. Support for Story of the Day comes from Pearsall Wealth Management at UBS Wealth Management USA, subsidiary UBS AG, member FINRA SIPC, 1 Broad Street, Glens Falls. Hey, I'm David Summerstein. It's Monday, June 19th. First, some voices from the Potsdam Juneteenth Festival on Saturday, which was moved indoors to Clarkson University due to the rain. I'm Nadine Manasse. I'm from Tanzania, a country in East Africa. Um, it's my first time celebrating Juneteenth. And I think Juneteenth to me means um, a celebration to keep the history alive, remembering the people who actually fought for um, the freedom that we have right now as black people, which is something I didn't have to think about before in my country. But coming here, I see the significance and the importance of keeping the history alive. Jennifer Backstrand, um, Juneteenth means a lot to me um, as far as it being when the last slaves were freed. And it means that people need to be educated on it um, because many people from the North Country don't know about it and didn't know anything about it until I decided to organize it in 2020. People, like I said, need to learn about it and... We need to just get more people throughout St. Lawrence County to organize events like this. That's people singing Lift Every Voice and Sing, also known as the Black National Anthem, at Saturday's Juneteenth celebration in Potsdam. Our intern Kelly Daphnis gathered those voices. There was also a big celebration in Burlington Saturday. Monica Sandresky spoke with Kim Carson, the director of the Office for Race, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging in Burlington, Vermont. They talked about how Juneteenth bridges very different feelings, remembering the pain of the atrocities of slavery and Jim Crow, treasuring the joy of freedom, and staying trained on the quest to be more free. There's times where we want to sit back and reflect and memorialize in a learning type environment that we need to know what history is so we don't repeat it. But also it's a celebration. It's a celebration of liberation. It's a celebration of light. It's a celebration of highlighting the black body and the black experience in a way that it's not about something negative, but very positive and that the community is coming together around that. And then lastly, you always want to constantly reflect on the history of where we've been to know where we want to go. Did you celebrate Juneteenth growing up? Actually, I did. I come from Iowa, and we were one of the first states to actually recognize it before it was a federal holiday. I remember always going to um, our park and basically uh, our black neighborhood in Iowa and just seeing all my family and friends and people that I call my cousins, right? In the black community, everybody's your cousin. And so all these people that we find, this extended family. And coming together and celebrating something that at one point was just so negative, but really turning it into a positive. And when I think about black bodies and blackness and the what our legacy really is moving forward is always being able to take something that may have been terrible and atrocity and finding a way to find the good. What does Juneteenth mean to you? Oh, man, Um, it means freedom. It means um, celebration. It means happiness. It means that we're continuing to strive to be perfect within this imperfection, right, that we call America. For me, it's a sense of excitement, but also to be seen. You know, as a black woman and a young black girl that is, I was a third generation Iowan, but I can, you know, my family has been here. I can't trace myself back to anywhere else but America. To start to be seen on a national level, especially because I don't see a lot of difference between my mother's experience and my experience, and she's in her 70s, and she was not born with all of her rights. I would be the first person born in my family in 1974 that was born with all my rights and the mechanism to litigate it. And so when you think about that, it's not that far away. Freedom is still new. 
but we can never close our eyes or think we're done. We must continue to strive. We must continue to elevate. We need to continue to educate, and we need to continue to uplift these holidays and commemorations to make sure that we're continuing to right this wrong and the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and all the things that we continue to strive to be better and do better. That's Kim Carson, the director of the Office for Race, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging in Burlington, Vermont. She spoke with Monica Sandresky. So Juneteenth officially commemorates June 19th, 1865, when Union soldiers arrived in Galveston, Texas, and announced the end of slavery, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Around that time, there were black Americans settling, farming, and raising families in the Adirondacks. Some scholars and local leaders have been digging deeper into that history and working to make the Adirondacks a more welcoming and diverse place today. Emily Russell has that story. For most of America's history as a nation, Black people have either been enslaved or oppressed. By the 19th century, slavery was abolished in the North, but there were still white Northerners who owned slaves, and all freed Black people lacked basic human rights. Even in the North, many Black people experienced severe discrimination. In the 1840s, a man named Garrett Smith set out to change that. He owned 120,000 acres of land in the Adirondacks. By giving away parcels of that land to black American men, those men could then gain the right to vote. Paul Smith's professor, Kurt Steger, has been researching black history in the Adirondacks. He recently presented some of those findings to the Adirondack Park Agency. The basic idea was to bring people of diverse backgrounds onto the land to live together and build communities out of mutual respect as neighbors and facing common challenges, which I think actually fits the theme of the Adirondack Park now as well, but it was uh, much more ambitious back then. That ambitious settlement became known as Timbuktu. Steger has been plotting where exactly those black settlements were in the Adirondacks. He showed the APA maps of those plots around the region. At least half of North Elba and much of St. Armand was black owned in the 1850s. There's the town of Franklin with Vermontville, and uh, Bloomingdale just below it, and all the way up to Loon Lake and beyond up into Belmont. So it was huge. About half of this landscape was Black-owned. Life in the Adirondacks was not easy back then, especially for Black people. Many eventually moved out of the area, but some stayed and raised their families in the Adirondacks. There are descendants of that Timbuktu settlement still in the region today. Another aspect of Steger's research has focused on place names. He explained to the APA about learning of an offensive name of a brook just north of Saranac Lake. Years ago, I was in Anchiota. The red star shows uh, the Paul Smith's College property. And I was talking to a friend who said, oh, that little brook right there, that's called N-word brook. I thought, wow, that's you know, not only offensive, but mysterious. How could that happen in a place like this? Steger believes the brook was named for the skin color of a dozen or so black families that lived in the area. So he and some other folks worked to change that name. They got support from students, faculty, and staff at Paul Smith College, as well as the Vermontville Town Council and county officials. They wrote to the U.S. Board on Geographic Names and were successfully granted permission to change the name to John Thomas Brook. Thomas was one of the first settlers of Timbuktu. The work to educate the public and celebrate the legacy of Black settlers and abolitionists in the Adirondacks is ongoing. Martha Swan also spoke at the recent APA meeting. Swan is the founder and executive director of John Brown Lives, a project named after the legendary white abolitionists who owned a farm near Lake Placid. Through this work that others have done and that we've done together, I have begun to believe in the unifying potential of our history, the unifying potential of rolling up our sleeves, digging deep into the horrors, the terrors, the tragedies, the violence, the crime of so much of our history. Swan helped organize the Juneteenth celebration at the John Brown Farm. Then in August, the farm is planning to host a long table dinner and discussion with leading scholars such as Nell Painter. The event is an effort to bring together diverse people and perspectives to talk about the history and the future of the Adirondack Park. Emily Russell, North Country Public Radio. 
We have more news all the time on our website, ncpr.org. Music today by Eddie Lawrence of Moira and Evan Veenstra of Gananoque, Ontario. I'm David Summerstein, North Country Public Radio.